Give him a hand clap of praise. All right. So I'm going to read to you Galatians 6, 6 and 7, real quick for our tithes and offerings. Look at this. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Are you guys taught in the word here in this church? Yeah, we are. And it says that we should provide for those who are teaching, sharing all good things. Why? Because verse 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. That's interesting that, that whether we share with those who teach the word, whether we're giving, tithing, and then it immediately brings up God's justice. Why don't you think about that for a minute? <laughs> Don't mock the just, you can't mock the just, um, justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. We have so much stuff that you can harvest in this church. We are not a dead church. We're busy. We're busy. We're doing a lot of stuff. We have a building projects that are going on all the time. We have the Freedom Fest that we're doing end of the month. We got the uh, K-12 school that is running. We have youth group every night i mean you can sew into everything we have missions now okay i mean we got stuff that if you want to harvest put in anything you have plenty of options plenty of opportunity to bless those and to be blessed in return because we already know we're supposed to tithe right i mean we already know that we're supposed to tithe yes or no Yes, absolutely. You're supposed to give, yes or no? Yes. Who wants to reap big? Yeah, come on. Why aren't your hands up back there? I want to reap big. Okay, Tim's got both hands up. I want to reap like him. All right? Be it according you, to your faith. Be it according to your faith. You're going to sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You want to reap big, sow big. And you have plenty of opportunity. Lord God, I pray today that you would bless and increase everything that anybody puts in, Lord and that you would bless the tithe, and that you would bless the one who is faithfully tithing and faithfully giving, that you would return to them according to your word and according to their faith, Lord. I pray that it be done according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. When, uh, before I retired several years ago, you may look at me and say, well, how could somebody as young as you retire? I don't know, but it happened, okay? I was so in fear about keeping my house because we were in debt, and, you know, when you retire, um, sometimes in the natural, your income changes, right? And so we didn't know how we were going to do that, and... Uh, when the time came, Brent and I just decided, well, have a house, don't have a house. We got each other and we got Jesus. Amen. So what happened was there, there was many a sleepless nights that I had, fitful nights of sleep where you just can't sleep because as a husband, you get it. You're supposed to be used by God to provide for your family, right? Well, to make a long story short, there was <laughs> funds coming from me from places that I worked over the years I didn't even know about. I didn't even know it was there. There was um, things just happened. So my point is this. We were able to pay off our house, get rid of all of our debt. But what about those sleepless nights that I had? Was I trusting in God? Well, if you would have asked me then, I said, yeah, I'm trusting God. But I'm telling you, when there's a strong man that gets a hold of your mind, and that strong man's name is fear, it can twist things inside of your soulish mind that you just don't know how to deal with. And I was... Brenna and I would turn it over to God. Yes, we turn it over, and then weeks later it'd come back, and then we turn it over and come back. I'm telling you, all that fear that was coming on me was whose fault was that? Was that the devil's fault? It was my fault, thank you, because I wasn't fighting like I was supposed to. So, I'm speaking across multi-generations. Is anybody here have been struggling with fear? Because if you are, I believe that Brenda and I and your pastor can break it off. Okay? So this, yeah, everybody's nodding. Yep, yep, yep. But you know who you are. I believe this is God. I believe the Holy Spirit's identifying things. You know what happens while you sleep. You know what happens when it's nagging at you during the day. Maybe it's a fear of losing a job. Maybe it's a fear of uh, a failure of health. Maybe it's a fear of you name it. But if you want that broken off of you, I believe that we can do it this morning. Right? Okay. I'm reminded as we're coming forward, I'm reminded of the whole series that we did, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of intimidation, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We can overcome these things through the power of God, through the love of God, through the fear of God operating in our lives. Whatever your fear is, we, it has a name, and we declare that it must bow to the name of Jesus Christ today. That you're not going to walk out of here the same in Jesus' name through joining together with other believers and through praying in faith in Jesus' name. Well, this thing will be broke today in Jesus' name, that we can move forward with the peace that passes all understanding in our hearts. Don't delay. If that's you, get up here. This is the moment. This is the moment that God has defined to set you free from that situation that you find yourself in. In the name of Jesus, Father, may we operate in faith and not fear. May we trust you, Father, as the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord God. May we understand that you have a plan, that all of our days have been wrote in your book, Father, that you have a plan, that you've never left us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will never relax your hold on us, Father. You'll never leave us. 
Thank you, Father, that you said that nothing can come before us that we can't handle in every test and every trial and every walk of life that you've given us a way out of every situation. And if it was too much for us to bear, that you wouldn't even allow it to come before us, Father. That's how great and awesome and mighty and powerful and protecting you are, Jesus. We thank you, sir. We thank you, sir, that these thoughts that have been bombarding our minds, Father, causing us to fret and worry and have anxiety, sir, we take a hold of these things. We take a hold of these things that are trying to create strongholds in our lives, and we loose them from their assignment against us. We recognize you, enemy, for what you are. And we take these thoughts captive in the name of Jesus, and we cast them down, and we replace them with what your word says, Father. And we boldly declare what Philippians 4, 8 says, that we will begin now to think on whatsoever things are pure and holy and just and virtuous and things that are worthy of praise. And we even steadfastly declare that we refuse to put life to these fears by speaking. By speaking these fears and putting life to them. We refuse to do that in the name of Jesus. We bind these things up. We loose them from their assignment against us in Jesus' name. We command these thoughts these fears, these anxieties, these worries about today and worries about tomorrow and what we'll wear and what we'll eat and all of these thoughts and concerns and cares, Father, we, we lay them at your feet, trusting you, God, as the author and the finisher of our faith. That you can get this done. In, in you, all things are possible. Thank you, Father that you have a plan for where we're to live and where we're to, what we're to eat and where we're to drive and car, cars that we're to drive and what we're to wear. Thank you, Lord God, that you have a plan and a purpose and a predestination for our lives. May we trust you. May we trust, Father, that these circumstances that we see with our eyes and hear with our ears, Father, that they did not catch you off guard that they did not dethrone you in any way, Father God, that you have a plan, that you have power and dominion over these things, and you've given us the power and the authority and the dominion to conquer these things and to rule and reign in this life. We recognize it, Father. We repent. We even repent, Father, for allowing these thoughts that are not of you to incubate in our minds and in our spirits and in our hearts. We recognize it now. We pull those things out. We cast those things down in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that all of our need is met according to your riches and glory. Thank you now, Holy Spirit, comforter, that you begin to flood our hearts and souls, our mind, our will, and our emotions now, Father God, that you flood us with peace that passes all understanding. Help us, Lord, to move forward and understand that faith overcomes fear. To trust you, God. To trust you, Father, with our future. Lord, if we can trust you with our past and redeeming our past, surely we can trust you with our future. We thank you that you have a plan. It's a good plan. We surrender to it. We yield to it. Thank you, Father. Safra mata celebre sul fra mota celebra mati si lefra cosoro mota si. Lefra mata si lefra mata solo fra boko soro mota frasi. Lebre si lefra mata salavra bata soro boko sole fra si. Bara la vrasi vete coso fra la brasa. Be glorified in this place, Father. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in our deeds and our words, Father, and even in our thoughts, in our wills and our emotions, Father. Be glorified, Father, in the things that we do. May we be pleasing to you. May we be pleasing to you, sir, with our thoughts, with our words, and even with our faith. We speak to these mountains. And we command them to move in Jesus' name. We speak to you, giants, or what seems like giants in our eyes is very small to you, sir. We speak to these giants and we command you, fall now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
body of water blocking our way, we command you to split. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that even that barricade that was blocking us, that now moves out of the way for us to go through, even encompasses our enemy behind us. Father, thank you that you are our shield and our buckler. That we rest, Father, in the secret place of the Most High. We find peace in your shadow, Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Thank you, sir. Greater is he who is in us than who is in the world. That we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. That we've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Lord, that you've already given us everything that we need for a life of godliness. Help us to walk in it, Lord. Help us to walk in it now, Father, in the name of Jesus. May we walk by faith and not by sight and not be moved by circumstance or what anyone around us is doing, the size of the bill and the size of our paycheck. We understand, sir, that you are our source. That you are our source of joy, our source of peace, our source of financial needs, physical needs. Be glorified, Father. As for me and my house, may we serve you. May we glorify you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we call upon you, that you answer us. That you're with us in trouble and that you rescue us. Lord, show us your salvation. Show us the fullness of your salvation. Teach us to grow in wisdom, Father. Come back to us and don't delay. Have mercy on us, your servants, Father. Lord, thank you that because of your goodness and your mercy and your grace that we sing for joy to the ends of our lives. Thank you, Lord for replacing the evil years with good. Thank you, Father, that our children see your glory. Father, show us your approval. Make our efforts successful, Father. Bless the work of our hands. Cause it to prosper, Lord. Make our efforts successful. In Jesus' name believe in you, Father. We believe in you, Father. We believe in you, Father God. We believe in you, Lord God. That you lead God and direct us. That you protect us, Lord. That you smile on us. That your mercies are new every morning. Again, Father, we thank you for peace that passes all understanding in our hearts in our minds and in our homes because you're Lord of them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord of all.
Who defined you? I encourage you, if you don't ever read these printouts, I can't tell you. There's every time I've come in here, every one of them has ministered to me. <laughs> Revelations 12.10. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. Some people will try to define you by your mistakes. They stick labels on you with accusations, reminding you of the times you failed, times you compromised, times you didn't measure up. Kristen, Jesus loves you. Don't give up, Chrissy, okay? You're not defined by your mistakes. You are not defined by the things that you did, some by your own will and some that the enemy tricked you with, okay? And this is for me too, because I've been there. If you gave into the temptation or if you got a divorce or if you failed your business, and I'm just going to add here, if you just made a bad choice, if you got into drugs, if you got into a, a different lifestyle, if you had an abortion, you know, sometimes the enemy wants to throw that back at me. And I have to stand firm of what the Word of God says. I will not let that define me at all. And don't let that define you either. Don't let people label you. They can't stop what God has ordained in your life. The only person that can stop you is you. If you believe the lies from the accuser of the brethren, that will keep you from your destiny. You may have failed, but you're not a failure. That moment of your life doesn't determine your future. You can't stop others from putting a negative label on you, but you can take it off. As soon as they put it on you or say something about you, you just turn right back around and say, that is not who I am. I'm not defined by my mistakes. I'm defined by what God says about me. Because I am forgiven. You all are forgiven if you've accepted Jesus. You are a redeemer. My failures are in my yesterdays. I know that there's times when we're trying to maybe come back to the Lord from a, a life of sin, that there's a time where it feels like you're trying to reacclimate, if that's a good word, where you almost kind of feel like a fish out of water when you're, you're, you're it's like, I love Jesus, but I've got years of doing things my own way and now I'm trying to do it God's way and I'm just trying to figure it out and I'm trying to like find my identity in this moment and, and get some solid footing underneath me and that, that, so that these roots can actually begin to take root and produce fruit um, I got a we can make some copies of this but this is who I am in Christ and it's just literally two pages of what verse after verse after verse after verse says of who I am 
in Jesus Christ. I am alive with Christ. I am free from the law of sin and death. I am far from oppression, and I do not live in fear. I'm born of God, and the evil one does not touch me. It just keeps going and going and going. Two pages of who I am in Christ. And I would say that this is good confessions of faith. That when you are in a place where it seems like you're struggling, trying to find out who I am, what I am, where do I belong, what's my function in life, this is what the Word of God says you are. So I'm going to give this back to Jeff, and he can make some copies of that if you want it. Just get with him. I tried to print 10 of them. For some reason, it wasn't going. But understand that God is with you. He loves you. He has a plan. Never get fearful. Keep trusting God. Keep trusting God. Keep doing it his way. And I promise you, you will not lose. I didn't say it wouldn't be a battle. I didn't say you wouldn't have some fights to win. But God is going to be with you through it. And he's given you the weapons and the tools to do it. You will win with him. Just keep going strong. You receive it? All right, come on, give the Lord a hand. We love you, Lord. All right, give somebody some love before you sit down. I just want to, this morning when I was in pre-service prayer, I was just praying for the church. And the slides go in the morning about all the things we have going on. And I want you guys to know, as I sat there, I watched people serve our pastor and serve this church. And all throughout this morning service, I... When Leela, when you hugged somebody, I don't even know who it was. The Lord, that, I just saw that as we are a body ministering to one another. It's body ministry. I, when people were praying, people who came up behind others who, Corey, you came over and you put your hand on your children and then you put your hand on my daughter. We, we love each other in this church as if these children are our own. We care about one another. We, you hugged somebody you loved on them you you hugged her i saw us at work an army at work loving the people in this church so i think you put a cough drop whatever you did in there serving one another god's if i saw it i know our heavenly father sees it i know he does and the reward is not here the reward for those guys working the sound it's not here. There's no way we could do this alone. There's no way Pastor Bill could be up here and back there. There's no way just me and my husband and my kids could do this. It takes all of us for this church. This is a body of believers. I'm so proud to be a part of this church with all of you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I mean, we couldn't do it. You, you had a vision. God gave you a word, and you ran with it. It seemed crazy, but look where we are now. Amen? I just want to thank you all. I know the Lord sees it, and he smiles. Amen?
Amen, amen, amen. How many people are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. I know I am too. Um, the end of this month, we've got a pretty cool event coming up. Freedom Fest 2023 with Disciple and Honor and Glory will be here. Concert starts at, sorry, event starts at 6, concert starts at 8, fireworks at 10. Food trucks that we have coming, we have Sunnyside Mexican Monahan Barbecue. Uh, Wing Diggity is a chicken and fish deep fry kind of food. It's awesome. Bubbles Cafe Paradise and a elephant ear company just contacted me. We also have roasted almond truck coming. So I guess there's seven this year, so that'll be awesome. Any, um, I, I'm just telling you that this is going to be an event that you do not want to miss. There's more stuff coming besides what's even on here. Um, I did put a flyer for this event in the center of your bulletin. I'm just asking you to just leave this somewhere. Don't put it in your car and it's on your floorboard and don't put it on your refrigerator because you know about it. <laughs> Leave this somewhere where somebody's going to see it. Out in the community. Of course, we've got that ad that's running on Facebook too. You can share that, put it out a little bit further, but God's going to do some amazing things in that event. Amen? Amen. All right, John 10.10 10 says... Jesus talking, I have come to give you life, that you might have life, that you might enjoy life, life more abundantly to the fullest, overflowing with goodness, a better life than we could have dreamed of. So Jesus died to give you an abundant life. Look at the definition of abundant. Having plenty of something, to have over and above what is needed, more than necessary, above average, having the advantage. Does any of these describe your life? If not, we might be doing it wrong. If Jesus said, I have come, died, shed my blood, <laughs> rose again to give you this, then why aren't we living in it? Then why aren't we living in it? So our goal here is to see a generation of people, young, men, young and old men and women, not just living, but actually living in the abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give us, to awaken this extraordinary understanding that there are qualities on the inside of us, given by the Holy Spirit, given by God, to accomplish great things. You know, Monica said it here, that the Lord gave us a vision in 2014, and at the time, it seemed crazy. We, talk, we shared that last week, handed out the vision and the mission statement, and talked about, man, we've accomplished a lot of the things on that list. There's only a couple things we haven't accomplished so far, and we're going to get them in Jesus' name. But understand that there is power on the inside of you to be distinguished, to be unique, to live extraordinary lives through the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him, for those who fear Him, for those who obey Him. I'm telling you, we haven't seen anything yet. We haven't heard anything. and You haven't even imagined what God has in store and what God has planned for our future, what God wants to do. We should be extraordinary people doing extraordinary things through extraordinary power of God operating and working on the inside of our lives. Amen. Come on, church. The early church, the book of Acts church, we see them doing great and mighty extravagant things for the kingdom. We're in the New Testament church just like the book of Acts. So why are we not doing it? We need to press into this. One of the greatest struggles of the early church was trying to convince people that they were not gods because of the great things that they were doing. We see like Peter and Paul literally had people bowing down and worshiping them because they thought they were gods and they'd have to pick them up. Look, what are you doing? We're just men like you. What are you doing? They even had temple priests trying to offer bulls and rams and sacrifices to them because of the mighty things that they were doing. Other times we see in the New Testament where believers were turning whole cities upside down for Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. we got to understand that if we're going to live in and abide in and walk in and thrive in this abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give us, you must understand that you are loved. You must understand who you are in Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He died for us because He loves us. He was betrayed and gave His life for us. He, he was judged and condemned and punished and scourged and tormented and put to death for us. Listen, Bob, He took our place. You and I deserve the punishment of hell, and God took our place. Why would He do that? Because He loves us. 
Because He loves us that much. Ephesians 2, 4 says, God was so rich in mercy. And He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life. He died so that we could live in this abundant life that He desires for us. Because of that, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Therefore, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to Him. Therefore, we make it our aim as we're living this life, whether present or absent, to ma- we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to Him. With the love of God at the foundation, we need to move forward. How, how do we please God? To reiterate, listen, we can't do anything to make God love us more. We can't, make, we can't do anything that would make God love us any less. But He, he does respond to what we're doing. If, we're, if He's pleased with us, is determined by what we're doing. Titus 1.16 says, Such people claim that they know God, but deny Him by their faith, but deny Him by the way that they live. They claim to know God, but is He really pleased with how we are living? Is, and is, is His pleasure... We've got to understand, His pleasure in us is based on the choices that we're making. His pleasure in us is based on the life that we're living and the things that we're saying and how we're loving one another. 1 Corinthians, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Therefore we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to Him. We make it our aim. We make it our goal. Our greatest desire as children of God should be to thrill our Heavenly Father. At the end of the day, our our goal and our drive throughout the day should be, man, is Jesus smiling about what's going on right now in my life with what I'm saying? If we get into the Greek words on this and well-pleasing, it's translated accurately. Not just pleasing, but well-pleasing. Well-pleasing. That's what he's trying to... So again, average should not be our target here. When we're talking about well-pleasing to our Father, average should not be the target. We should be passionately in pursuit of giving our absolute best to the one who died for us. Look at it in the message translation. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 message says, cheerfully pleasing God. That's the main thing. What we aim to do, regardless of our conditions. I love it. The main thing, the main purpose, the, 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 the driving motivation of our life as a believer. Nothing should take preeminence over our lives and our desires to make Him proud. I'm going to say this too. We have opportunities to please our Heavenly Father while we're living in these bodies, in the here and now, that we won't have later. You have opportunities to please your Father right now on this earth. Listen, because when, ev- when we get to heaven, there's not a need for faith. Right? You're there. I don't need to receive it by faith. I've got it. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be enduring trials, and we don't need courage, and we don't need boldness to witness. We've, we're there. But these are opportunities, while we're present in these earthly bodies, these are opportunities to please our Heavenly Father in. So we make it our aim, we make it our goal to be well-pleasing to Him. Well-pleasing to Him at work, well-pleasing to Him at home, at the office, on social media, with our words, with our deeds. Make it our aim to be well-pleasing to Him, to be movers and shakers, not only in our churches, but in our cities. Ask ourselves, are you, is your life well-pleasing to Him? Is there any areas that we could do it better in? I mean, literally begin to, begin to evaluate. Think about what you did this week and the things that you said. And maybe you had a, a hot temper moment or you said something you regretted. Think about it. What can you learn from We sat down yesterday at family dinner. We said, how was your week? Tell me something great that took place. And they said, okay, now tell me where you missed it this week. I was looking for opportunities from my family members to share, yeah, I did this, and that was a big mistake. That was a fail. Why are we doing that? Because we're building up one another, and we're trying to make sure that others don't fall into the same trap that 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 person just fell into. Take aim. 
Make it our goal to be well pleasing to him. Look at this quote from Alexander McLaren. He's a Scottish Baptist minister. He said, you report to headquarters and you never mind what anybody else thinks of you. Your business is to please Christ and the less you trouble yourself with pleasing men, the more you will succeed in pleasing God. Amen. Love it. If we're going to live this life with this goal as the standard for our life, if you'll walk in this, two things are going to result. You're going to have abundant joy and you're going to have complete fulfillment. Do you have it now? Because you can. As believers, we should have an innate desire to please our Heavenly Father and have an inward peace as a result of what we're doing. Our primary motivation should be pleasing our Heavenly Father. The primary motivation for that should be driven by our love for Him. We love Him. He died for us. We adore Him. We follow Him. We pursue Him. He is Lord, and He is Lord because He loved us first. Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given it to us. Would you say that the love of God is oozing out of you? As a child of God, our greatest satisfaction should come from knowing that God is pleased with us. Ask yourself, is God pleased with what I'm doing, with what I'm saying, with what's happening in my life? Is God pleased? If we're going to walk with this perspective, I'm telling you that there is nothing that can overpower the joy and the peace that passes all understanding and knowing that God is with us. God is with us. The second benefit of pleasing our Heavenly Father is that we'll be greatly rewarded. Greatly rewarded. How many people want to be greatly rewarded when we stand before Jesus' throne? Come on. Might sound like a selfish thing, but that's the exact reason that Paul exhorts us in this passage of Scripture in the first place. Let's look at it again. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Next verse. Therefore. Why is the therefore therefore? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim. Meaning, I'm going to leave this body and I'm going to be standing before Jesus and He is going to judge my life. Therefore, I make it my aim to be well-pleasing to Him, whether present or absent, whether dead or alive, to be well-pleasing to Him. Amen. 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive the things done in this body. That's reward. According to whether it's good or bad. So we're all going to stand before Jesus Christ. We're all going to give an account, and you're either going to receive a reward or you're going to receive great loss. We're not talking about love. We're not talking about you getting God's love or losing God's love. God loves you unconditionally. That will never change. He sent His Son Jesus to die for you. That's settled. When we're, when we're talking about reward or suffering loss, at the throne room of Jesus Christ, that is completely up to you and based on your works. And after that, there's only two places. Once we stand before Jesus, there's only two places we can go, heaven or hell. There is no paradise of virgins. There is no purgatory. There is no limbo. There is no reincarnation. There's no higher state. There is only a very real heaven and a very real hell. And whether you go there is whether it's up to you whether you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord or not. Jesus is the only way. You either go up or you go down, and it's based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, again, I'm not being harsh. I'm not being judgmental. We're just telling you the truth this morning. These are the facts. John 3, 17, interestingly, right after John 3, 16, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in the Son is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned because they don't believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus didn't come with condemnation. The world was already condemned. Jesus came to save us and to set us free from the condemnation that we found ourselves stuck in. 
I've heard troubled people make comments like, why would a loving God ever send a people that he loves to a place so terrible like hell? The answer is he doesn't. God does not send one person to hell. People make the choice to go there. Jesus gave us the way out. First of all, we have to understand that hell was not even created for mankind, for men or women. It was created for Satan and fallen angels who were disobedient to God. We see that in Matthew 25, 41. It says, Be gone from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for who? It doesn't say mankind. God never intended for mankind to be in this place of torment and torture. Because God is love and everything about Him is love. He also walks in justice, though. He gave us commands and He gave us consequences when those commands are not followed. And so He cannot show favoritism with mankind over the devil. Listen, God can't lie. He can't bend the rules. He can't make excuses. He can't go back on His Word. And if He did, He would no longer be God. God is just. And so what He says, what he says goes across the board. Titus 1-2 says, God cannot lie. Listen, man was legally condemned to hell because of sin, because of disobedience, because God gave commands with consequences. So now that we, are, because of it, we are a slave to sin, doomed with eternal consequences, and those consequences being the same fate as Lucifer and the fallen angels. Come on. And so if God was to lighten the punishment of sin for mankind, then God would no longer be a just judge. And Satan could literally, rightfully, stand before God and accuse him of bending the rules making God a liar, behaving in an unjust manner because God was showing favoritism and being partial towards mankind over someone else. Listen, it's the very character of God that makes God God. It is the foundation of who He is. And so as a result, mankind had to receive the same punishment as fallen angels because of sin. Any sinners in the room? Let me say, hold on, let me say it this way. Any ex-sinners in the room? I don't want you identifying as a sinner because then you act like one. Ex-sinners. So God had a problem that he was separated from his prized possession, his masterpiece, the ones that he loved. And so he had to come up with a divine plan to fix the problem that we got ourselves into. And that meant that Jesus Christ had to die for us. Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, fathered by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, and free from the curse of sin. Was without sin. And so he was the only one who could lawfully and rightfully pay the price for man's sin. Only Jesus could get us out of the judgment that we deserve. Do you deserve it? Did you break the law? Even if you stole a paperclip, you deserve hell because you broke the law. But Jesus took these sins on the cross. Look at 1 Peter 2.24. It says, He personally carried our sins in His body on the cross so that we could be, everybody say, dead to these things. Dead. Not continue to live in them. We're supposed to be dead to these sins. He personally carried them in His body on the cross so that we would be dead to these things and now live for what's right. Come out from among them and be separate. Come out from among your old life and be new. He took our punishment. He took our place on that judgment seat by one man, Adam. We got everything screwed up. Sin entered the world. And by one man, Jesus Christ, eternal life and salvation was now made available to us. Look at this in Romans 5.18. The message translation says, here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us into all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just got us out of trouble, he got us into Zoe life. Abundant life. Jesus fixed what Adam screwed up. And so when men and women give their lives, their hearts to Jesus Christ, we gain life. 
and we gain victory over the curse of sin and death has finally been broken. The judgment that has been held against us has been completely satisfied. Somebody who was worthy enough to do it paid the price for you and me. And so now, because of what Jesus Christ did, the whole salvation package that Jesus Christ died to give us, now God the Father can justly and legally grant us entrance into his kingdom. That's a good spot to clap, church. Can justly and legally let us into his kingdom and not violate his integrity. So powerful. So powerful. I don't think we can even fully wrap our minds around all the things that Jesus Christ has done for us. It's an extraordinary plan prepared by our amazing Father. Salvation through Jesus Christ. The most important decision that you will ever make. I want to talk about, is God pleased with us? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to be well-pleasing to him. Ten, for we must stand before Christ to be judged and receive whatever reward we deserve for the good or the evil that we've done in this body. Again, because of this, because we're going to stand before that judgment, see, we have got to get eternally minded in our daily walk with Jesus Christ. Filtering every decision and every word and every step through, man, is this going to glorify Jesus? Is this, going to, is this God's plan for my life? When I stand before his throne, is this... Th not fearfully, like, intimidated, but in the fear of God. Make it our aim, make it our goal to be well-pleasing to Him. Again, we're advised by the Word of God to be pleasing to the Heavenly Father because He's going to judge us. And some may ask, well, I thought Jesus came to save us from all that judgment stuff. Well, He did in the aspect of the judgment that sends you to heaven or hell. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord, He is Savior from hell and praise God for it. But one day you will stand before him as your judge when it comes to reward. Every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and rewards will be given based on what we did with this short time on earth. 2 Corinthians 5.10, I think we did the CEV on this one, but it says we're going to receive what we deserve. We are going to receive what we deserve for what we did on this planet. We need to get this. We need to get this. This is pretty serious. Again, with the foundation and the understanding that Jesus' blood eradicated the eternal punishment that was due to us, at this judgment seat, we are either going to accept reward or face Loss. Suffer loss as a laborer, as a believer, for the works that we did as a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's be clear. We're not saying that you're saved by works. I just want to be clear. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift from God. You didn't deserve it, and you didn't earn it. God gave salvation to you simply and only because He loves you. James 2.26 says, Just as the body is dead without the spirit, faith without works is dead. They go hand in hand. You can't have faith without works. Come on, faith and works go hand in hand. This is an elementary doctrine of Christianity. This is a foundational doctrine that we're building the rest of our lives on. I mean, Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians 3.11. says, No other foundation can save anyone. This is elementary. The entire foundation that a believer's life should be built on is found here. We must understand, faith and works go hand in hand. It's an elementary doctrine. Colossians 2.6 says this, And now, just as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, that's faith, you must continue to follow Him. That's works. Faith and works go hand in hand. Verse 7 says, So let your roots go down deep and let your lives be built on Him. He's the cornerstone. It's a good name for a church. We should call one that sometime. <laughs> then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Because Jesus Christ is Lord, now you've got some work to do. 
You got to live in union with him. You got to build on the foundation. You got to get your roots growing down deep in him. You got work to do. You have an assignment to fulfill. We got to build our lives around Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Build what? That means works. 1 Corinthians 3.12 says, Anyone who builds on that foundation can use a variety of materials. Gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw. We've seen some shacks down there in Guatemala that were built from some materials that are not going to last the test of time. I mean, just a good wind and those things are coming down. Come on. We're supposed to be building. These are works. As a result of your faith, gold, silver, precious stones all represent things of eternal value. Where wood, hay, and straw represents things that are temporal, things that won't last, things that have no value. And so you have a choice every day, every hour, every moment that you can build something in your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ that either has eternal value or no value. It's your choice. It's truly up to you whether or not you are well-pleasing to God with reward or not. But know this, your reward in heaven and your reward here on earth is a reflection of your choice. The kingdom of God is here too. So your choices are affecting the life that you're living now as well as eternity. Let's look at it again, 1 Corinthians 3.12. Anyone who builds on that foundation, again, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, can use a variety of materials. Say, that's me. I'm the builder, and I have to build. So what are you building with? Gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, straw? Which one? Because on Judgment Day, if we keep reading in verse 13, on Judgment Day, which we're all going to stand before, it says fire. Everybody say fire. fire. Say, my God is a consuming fire. Because that's what the Bible says. Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. That's you. You're the builder that's standing before this judgment day, and fire is going to reveal what you built. Fire will show if the person's, everybody say work. Fire will show if the person's faith has any value. The work of every believer will become plain, openly known for all to see. The day of Christ is going to disclose it and declare your works. The fire is going to reveal. The fire is going to test and critically appraise the character and the worth of every work of every believer. When you put wood, fire under wood, hay, straw, what happens? It burns. It's gone. She gone. It's devoured. It no longer exists. There is no value. None. But if you put fire under gold and silver and precious stones, not only do they remain, but they're purified. They actually have more value. They gain value. 1 Corinthians 3.13, on the day of judgment, fire will show if the person's work has any value. 14, if your work survives the fire... The builder, that's you, will receive reward. 15, but if the work is burned up, wood, hay, straw, you got to get this. That's the, the, the substance of your life is pushed into a pile and it's lit on fire. Everything that represents you. You're before the throne in heaven being judged and measured against what God's plan was for your life. It's all going to be pushed into a fire and lit. The sum of you. What are you building with? This is not a joke. 
This is serious. Because we think that, well, we're just trying to fix some runny noses and just make it another week. No, the sum of your life is weighed in the balance in this moment. And everything about eternity from that moment is based on what's left. If the work is burned up, the builder, that's you, will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the walls of fire, the flames of fire. Again, we're not, we're, Jesus bought you salvation. Your works, and the only way that you can accept that gift is by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and living for him. Right? That's salvation. But we're talking about now what's, what's your assignment in heaven? Where do you live in heaven? What are you doing for eternity with Jesus Christ? We're going to be ruling and reigning with him, right? That means we're not just floating around on clouds playing harps here. We're going to be ruling and reigning the world with Jesus Christ with assignments and duties and responsibilities. And if you can't be trusted with the stuff here, you built with wood, hay, straw, you're not doing anything great for the kingdom there either. If any product of a believer's efforts survives the test, they will get a reward in heaven. But if the person's work is burned up, they're going to suffer loss. Notice the two words in this verse here, reward and loss. Reward and loss. It's totally up to you. This might be shocking. Might not coincide with what you've been taught your whole life. You might have been under the impression that you go to heaven and we all get equally rewarded, but it's just not biblical. According to it's communism. According to these verses, believers reward is based on performance. James 2.26, faith without works is dead. Read the whole chapter. Many denominations believe that you know, you're saved by good works, and the more good works that you do, then the more saved you are. Just light some candles and play with some beads and Hail Mary, and you're all good. It's enlightening to know that after we give our lives to Jesus Christ, that there's no purgatory, there's no price that we have to pay to enter into heaven. Jesus already paid every price that you could ever pay. You're not good enough to do it in and of yourself. To pay the price needed, Jesus already did it. We're saved because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation is a free gift from God, and it's, not again, not based on your works, your good deeds, your good looks, or even keeping the laws, but your reward is... Your reward is. Some people confuse salvation with eternal rewards, and they're not the same. Well, if I go to heaven, then, I'm, then I get reward. Well, there is a reward of just the fact of being in heaven versus hell. But there's so much more. There's so much more than, than just fire insurance from living this life with Jesus Christ. The scriptures clearly show us in 1 Corinthians 3.14, if the work survives the fire, the builder, that's you, receives reward. But if it's burned up, the builder, that's you, suffers loss. Paul writes that there are people that will be truly saved by grace, that they're allowed to enter into heaven because they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord, but they will lose the reward that God desired for them to have because of how they lived here. Man, that's so weighty. Simply because they did not please God. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, then keep my commands. Scripture shows us that there will be those who will be greatly rewarded because of their lives with Jesus Christ because they please God. And these faithful, fruit-producing saints are going to be compensated for their good works even to the point of reigning right beside Jesus. Man, who gets that position? We got to understand heaven is real. Hell is real. 
There's two judgment seats, one for the non-believer and those who are followers of Jesus Christ. One judgment seat sends you into eternal lake of fire, and at the other one, rewards are being handed out for all the things that we did. Why not live extraordinary then? Why not die to this life and die to ourselves and live in and walk in this abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give us? It's a better life to live in the first place, but it also comes with greater eternal reward. It's a win-win. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Therefore, because of everything that we've been saying, make it your aim to be well-pleasing to Him. Come on, we got to understand that these decisions that Jesus renders on Judgment Day is eternal. It's eternal, meaning there is no revisions, there's no alterations, there's no amendments, there's no changes. These decisions are final. Stop and think about it. This is truth. What we do at the cross determines where we spend eternity, heaven or hell, and the way that we, be, that we live as believers determines how we spend eternity, either with rewards or loss. It's up to you. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3 says, let us stop going over the basic elementary teachings about Christ again and again, and let us instead become mature in our understanding. Here's this person, Shirley, again. Shirley! We don't need to start again with the, with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. Come on, church, seriously? Are, are we still talking about repenting? You know it's wrong. Just stop doing it. I mean, it's, it's elementary. It really is childish that you're still doing that. You know it's wrong. Just stop doing it. Do we really need to go over the basic things again and again? Surely we don't need to do the fundamental importance of repenting from evil works and placing your faith in God. Two, do you need further instructions about baptisms? Plural, water and fire. Laying out of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. Eternal judgment is right there. You see that as a foundational elementary doctrine? The fact that you're going to stand before God on judgment day and rewards and losses are going to be handed out, it's an elementary doctrine. Christianity 101, yet it's amazing how many Christians are ignorant, uninformed of these basic truths. The Word describes these as elementary. The foundation, this is the foundation of, that our whole Christian walk is built on. This is Christianity 101 stuff, like kindergarten stuff. Repenting from dead works, faith in God, baptisms, water and fire, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. It's elementary. Elementary is defined as involving or encompassing only the most simple, basic principles and facts relating to elementary school. What do you get in elementary school? It's the entire foundation for the rest of your life. You're learning to read, you're learning to write, you're learning to add, you're learning to subtract. Imagine trying to accomplish your high school, your college education, your high school education without, you can't read, you can't write, you can't add, you can't subtract. You're 30. <laughs> Yet we as believers are attempting to build our life with Jesus Christ, and we don't have these. You're no different than the 30-year-old who can't add and subtract. Elementary. No wonder the church appears like it does. No wonder the church is not doing the things that the book of Acts church was doing. No wonder we're not living the extraordinary, abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give us. We're still trying to figure out what is sin. We're still trying to figure out if we're boys or girls. We're still trying to figure out if is tongues of the devil or not. It's in the Word. Verse 
Water baptism is a symbol of you're dying to yourself and you're coming up to a new life with Christ. What is the point of you getting dunked in that tank if you're going to live the same way you were living? It's elementary. How are we ever going to walk in abundance and change the world like Jesus wants to do if we can't even get these simple things figured out? We've, we possess, as believers, we possess a false humility. In regards to eternal rewards, we possess this attitude of gratitude when it comes to salvation, which is good and right. But the idea of laboring for reward a lot of people look at it like it's presumptuous, it's arrogant, it's something that's it's far from the truth. But look what John wrote here. Keeping in mind that John is just the secretary that's writing down what God said when we read this. 2 John 1.8 says, look to yourselves, mean be watchful, be careful, that we don't lose the things we worked for, that we might receive... Our full reward. Not just reward, but full reward. Not part of it. Get all of it. And again, that's God the Father saying that. Listen, you're going to be here. Here's your assignment. Go get her done. And get your full reward. I mean, who doesn't love to challenge their children to, uh, with the promise of compensation for their labor? Hey, Tori Lynn, make me lunch. I'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> it delights us when our children rise to the occasion, fulfill our request, and we're thrilled to reward them for their hard work. Where did we get that from? Our Heavenly Father. God is no different. There's times that my children didn't fully complete everything, and I wasn't able to give them their reward. Otherwise, I would be an unjust parent, giving every, oh, everybody gets a gold star. No, you did it wrong. Go back and do it again. I just said this to one of my children just a couple days ago. If you didn't get it right the first time, do it again. We can't go back on our words, and God is the same way. He refuses to reward his children who are not doing what he said to do. I heard one preacher share a story about his son who worked in ministry with them. Their, their ministry is they supply resources and supplies to pastors and teachers all over the world, Christians really too, just equipping believers all over the world. And the son asked him, what would you do if we doubled pro productivity from last year? And he thought about his request. He thought it was unattainable. So he said, I blurted it out real fast, really, before I thought about it. I said, yeah, if you guys do that, I'll take your whole team on a cruise. Because he felt it was unattainable. Double? Ha, sure. Throw it out there. The son smiled. He said, thank you. He got to work. He had faith. He prayed. He worked hard. The stuff began to mushroom. Twelve months later, all the tallies in. Three times. <laughs> Three times the year before. Their performance was extraordinary, and that preacher said, I kept my word and smiled the whole time while we did it. He said, why? Because the kingdom was advanced. People grew. More people grew. We got resources into their hands, and not only did I bless them and reward them, but one day they're going to stand before their heavenly Father and get eternal reward for their labor. That was extraordinary. Powerful. 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 God has set goals for each and every one of our lives and recorded them and wrote them down in our book. How are you doing with it? Is God pleased with your efforts? Psalms 139.16 says, I saw, You saw me before I was born, and every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment laid out before a single day passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God, they cannot be numbered. What a phenomenon that God the Father is actually mindful of us. Did you know that, God, that there were books written about you? That it's not just famous people who have biographies. There's your story, wrote in a book, and authored by none other than God himself. That's a staggering thought. That God has a plan. God has a plan for every day of your life 
wrote in a book. Every moment, every hour, every, every, every second, every fraction of your life has been wrote in a book and it's been approved by and designed by God Almighty. How powerful and how amazing and how awesome is that? That God has a destiny for you. He set goals for you to accomplish and wrote them all down. Boy, I'd like to get my hands on that book. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we could do what? Live our own lives how we choose to? What's it say? What does it say? To do works, but not just works. Good works. And not just good works, but the ones that he planned long ago. Look at it in the Amplifying. That we might do the good things God has predestined and planned beforehand. That we might take the path which he prepared ahead of time. That we should walk in them. Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Does that describe you? Does that describe you? If not, you're doing it wrong. God planned the path before you were even born. And Paul writes that we should walk in them. It doesn't say that we would walk in them. There's a big difference here. Free will comes into play. Fulfilling those assignments does not happen automatically. You have to choose to do it. we got to cooperate with the plan of God and actually labor to get it done. God has set goals, but it's up to us to not only discover them, but fulfill them. How do I do that? I do that through getting in my prayer time and praying in tongues and reading the Word of God and getting wise counsel from my pastor and other Ephesians 4 gifts. we got to discover what has been written and predestined for our lives and then by His grace fulfill the assignments that we've been sent here to do. Colossians 1.9 says that we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. And we ask that God would give you complete knowledge of his will. Meaning it was not automatic. We had to pray to get it. Why? So we can do it. Why do I need knowledge of his will for any other reason than to do it? To give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then, verse 10 says, the way you live will honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit, reward, 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 all the while as you grow to learn God more and live better and better. We ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will to give you wisdom and understanding so that you'll be able to live the life that God wants you to live and actually please Him. Only then can our lives actually produce the fruit that God is looking for. And by the way, if you read your Bible, if you're not producing fruit, your branch is cut off and cast into the fire. Come on. we got to understand that this is not inevitable. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You have to pursue it, and you have to labor to make it happen. God has extraordinary plans for us, for our families, for this church, but it will not be accomplished without prayer and without faith and without fervent labor. Hard work. That's the reason that we're called fellow workers with God. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. It says, we are God's servants. <laughs> what is a serving, servant doing? Working. Each of us should do the work that the Lord gave us. 6 says, I planted the seed in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. 7, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering, just that the seed is growing, that God makes it grow. 8, the one who plants... And the one who waters works together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their hard work. It does not say faith. It does not say that you'll be rewarded for faith. Faith and works go hand in hand. We have a part to play in working hard to make this kingdom advance. And we will be rewarded accordingly. But you have to search out your personal assignment and work at it. Some people are not happy that God has this plan because, you know, they, 
My life is just to live however I want to live. I'm a free-blooded, red-blooded American. By God, I'll do what I want. No, you're not. No, you're not. Your feet might be currently touching the ground in America, but you are a citizen of heaven. And you will submit. But there's no fear in that. And there's no remorse in that. Because it's a good life that's followed by reward and eternity in heaven with our Maker. It's a good life. Some people think, well, I just get born again and I attend church and I do my best to try to treat people well and I get a job and I retire and I die and I go to heaven. Boring. <laughs> Boring. How sad to give up this abundant, extraordinary, extravagant life that we're talking about for that. How sad. Boring. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. They are good and not for disaster to give you future and a hope. God has a plan for our welfare and for our peace. And he has a plan for us to not experience evil. Plans to give you hope. And he expects us to seek him out and find him and activate him in our lives. Ephesians 5, 17 says, Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but with understanding, understanding firmly grasp the will of God for your life. CEV translation states this a little more bluntly. It says, listen, don't be stupid. Instead, find out what the Lord wants you to do. Isn't it great and powerful and awesome that God is mindful of us and that He has a plan for us, that he's, he's thought, He has thoughts towards us and, and wants us to walk in, in every day, every moment, relationship with Him. He wrote this plan in a book. And so I'm here to tell you today that your plan and your life is supposed to be unique, that you are special, that you are not an accident, that you are not damaged goods, that you are not lost among the details of a crazy world. Come on, you are not common and you are not menial. You were created with a unique path and to be extraordinary through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 10.10 10 says, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly to the fullest to overflowing with goodness, a better life than you could have dreamed of. And so we're asking today, how is your life? Are you pleasing to God? Is there areas that you could please Him more? Have you sought God to find out what His plan for your life is? Because we're telling you that destinies are at stake, that lives are in the balance, and not just yours, but those around you. We're suffering as a result of you not doing your part of the plan. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to Him. If you want to live the abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give you, if you want to live the extraordinary life and do mighty exploits like the book of Acts through the Holy Ghost, if you want reward in heaven, when the fire's lit, you must please God. You must decide this day, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to serve God. You receive it? Father, in Jesus' name. Man, Lord, I think this might be one of the most important messages, aside, aside of salvation, that we could hear. Help us, Lord, to take these words to heart, to understand that you have a plan and a purpose and that your desire for us is to walk in that plan and that purpose, to fulfill our destiny. Lord, I pray that we make you proud, that we go above and beyond, that you smile on us, that you're gracious to us and merciful to, to us, Father. Help us to walk in the grace and the power of the Holy Ghost and fulfill everything that you've called us to. May we bring honor to you and glory to you, Father, with our words, with our deeds. May we be united together now more than ever and accomplish the goals that you put this church here to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen? amen. I love you.